Welcome back. Song of Solomon, part 18. In our previous segment, we saw how Christians have asked Jesus to leave and he has gone out and from out there, he is knocking and he is asking uh, whether we would allow him to come back. And I told you that I will explain how we have expelled Jesus from our lives, our families, and our churches. Well, we know who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Bible is the revealed Word of God to us. Well, you know, you are very intelligent people, so I don't want to explain too much. But the word of God doesn't begin in Genesis 1.1. And the word of God doesn't end in Revelation chapter 24. Why? Because the word of God does not have a beginning or an end. The word of God has been there even before Genesis 1.1. And the word of God is going to be there eternally even after Revelation 24. So what we have from Genesis to Revelation is the expressed word of God, revealed word of God, inspired word of God to us. Okay. So this word of God represents Jesus. Why? Because John 1.14 says, and the word became flesh. So to have Jesus in our lives is to have the word of God in our lives. To have Jesus in our families is to have the word of God in our families. And to have Jesus in our church is to have the word of God in our churches. Well, friends, you know, those of you who have studied in Bible colleges, you know all these criticisms, biblical criticisms, higher criticism, lower criticism, and all that kind of stuff. And many Christians have become so skeptical about the Bible. Many people look at the Bible, Christians, I mean others I understand, but Christians look at the Bible in a very critical way. In many Bible colleges, uh, innocent Bible students are taught to professionally criticize the Bible. So the Bible has become a book of criticism, not just by outsiders, but by us insiders and many people have dishonored the Bible the word of God has been either expelled from Christians or replaced by other things okay let's talk about our personal lives our family lives and our church lives okay personally how many of you read the word every day passionately well Suresh you know what we don't have the time because we are very busy. Yeah, that's the problem. Many Christians are too busy to, to spend time with the Bible. And I know that so many people read the Bible just as a bedtime sleeping pill right before sleeping. And, and, and they don't have a, a, a method to read the Bible. They don't sometimes read some of the hard to read, hard to understand portions of the Bible such as the books of Chronicles, they don't like name lists. They don't like those hard to understand scenarios. You know, they, 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 right before service, they, they, they say, oh God, speak to me from your word. And they put the finger and they open and what do they get? Usually the book of Psalms because that's the one that is right in the middle. And many people love to read the book of Psalms because there are 150 of those and they are very loving, nice, cuddly and... Uh, that's how, how many people read. Okay. Now we need to read the Bible. Many Christians. Now let me talk about maturity later on in our uh, study. But, but I'm just telling you many people don't know the list of the 66 books in the Bible. In their order. But they have been Christians for a long time. Okay. Many families don't have Bible reading as a family. Many individuals don't spend time reading the Bible a lot. And in many churches, the word of God has been replaced with other things. Look, if you replace anything, if you replace the word of God with anything, and that thing could be good or bad, that's bad. 
Worship is wonderful. Prophecy is one, wonderful. Anointing is great. Uh, ministry is superb. Healing and... Oh, these are all wonderful words of knowledge. Great. But when these things replace the word of God, then, then these things become bad. Many people are preaching many things like prosperity, healing, anointing, all that kind of stuff. Just to substantiate their theories, they pick and choose some Bible verses from here and there. But they don't preach the word as the way it should be. So, if you don't have the word of God in your lives, in your families, in your churches, then you are spiritually sleepy. You are sleeping. And the word of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, would politely get out. And from out there, he's knocking on the door of your heart, your family and your church. And he's saying, can I come back? In the form of his word, of course, Jesus is omnipresent, so he's everywhere. But he wants to bring his word back. Now, what is the response of the church? As I said in our last segment, not everybody. So if you are a word-abiding Christian, if you pastor a word-abiding church, wonderful, praise God for that. Okay, I'm talking about those who are not. Okay, here is their response. Verse 3, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Aha! Well, you know what? Two things are expressed in a metaphorical form here. Put off my coat. What is the coat? The raiment, the clothes of righteousness. We were unrighteous sinners. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. When Jesus came and he gave us life. Okay? We are born again. What he did, what did he do? He has clothed us with the cloth of righteousness. That's Christianity. What is righteousness by definition? Right relationship with God. Ha ha. Those of us who did not have a right relationship with God, are now, because we are Christians, through Christ, we have now the relationship with God. That is righteousness. Some Christians have removed the, the cloak of righteousness, the raiment of righteousness, thereby becoming unrighteous again. What is that? They have lost it. They are no longer in a right relationship with God. Now we are not here to discuss Calvinism. We are not going to discuss uh, eternal security. We are not going to discuss once saved, always saved. I mean, is it true or not? I don't believe in that. That's a different ball game. But what I'm saying is there are many Christians who have lost their right relationship with God. Families who are Christians, but they have lost relationship with God. Churches, many churches. They don't have a right relationship with God. What, what does that tell you? Backsliding. Ha ha. So, to putting off our coat is backsliding. Many of us have backslidden. There are two kinds of backsliding. One, the obvious kind. You know that this person is out. But the, the, the most tricky, subtle kind of Backsliding is that we are in the church, we worship, we, we do everything Christian, but then in our hearts we know that we are far, far from God, we are backslidden. So many Christians have backslidden personally. Many families have backslidden. Many churches, yes, they function as church, but, but they are backslidden. So the church is responding to Jesus who is now waiting outside, wanting to come in. They are saying, well, you know what? We are backslidden and we don't see a way to come back. I mean, there are many Christians. Perhaps you are one of them. If not, you know others who are. Once upon a time, they were wonderful Christians. Now, they are not. They are not in Christ. They are not in the church. They are not Christians. Okay? Backslide. 
Backsliding is very prominent nowadays. Many Christian countries have backslidden. Many American Christians have backslidden. Many Sri Lankan Christians have backslidden. Sad. Many Christians, Christian families have backslidden. Okay? Then the other thing is, um, I have washed my feet. How, how shall I defile them? What does that mean? Feet. Remember the beautiful chorus that we sing? How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, good news. Okay, the feet of him who brings the good news on the mountains are so beautiful. What is the metaphorical meaning of that? The beautiful feet are of those who serve God. And when you walk with your feet, when you climb hills and when you, when you cross quagmires, when you, when you go uh, passing damp lands and, damp lands and uh, muddy terrain, your feet are bound to get dirty. So the feet of the person who serves the Lord is dirty. Not in a spiritual sense, in a metaphorical sense. Okay? So here, these people are saying, I have washed my feet. Which means, I have quit serving the Lord. Aha! I have quit serving the Lord. Many Christians who were in the choir are no longer in the choir. Many Sunday school teachers do not do that ministry anymore. Now, serving the Lord involves any and everything, okay? From preaching the gospel, from teaching the Bible, from pastoring a church, to sweeping, to open and close the door, to, to, to work as an usher. Hey, many people have quit doing those things for right reasons. Right reasons. You talk to them, you would empathize with them. You would agree with them. So two reasons are shown by Christians, churches and Christian families for kicking Jesus out of their lives, families and churches. Number one, we have backslidden. We are no longer like the way we used to be. Number two, well, you know, we served the Lord, we did ministry, but then it's so hurtful. It consumes a lot of time, money, energy. Nobody appreciates us. Oh, you know what? I am going to teach a teaching in the near future on backsliding. Why would people backslide? Okay, so I will, I will do that. Many Christians have backslidden. Many people have quit serving the Lord. So that's what they are saying. They are saying, sorry Jesus, we cannot have you back in because we have backslidden. But look at Jesus in verse 4. He's saying, my beloved put, put in his hand by the hole of the door. Still the bride is talking. My beloved, beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door. Jesus is trying his level best to put his hand at least through a hole of the door to get you to open. He's not giving up. Why? Because it was so expensive for him to purchase the church. Remember how he died, how he bled to, to buy us back, to purchase us back. And he is not going to give us up Easily. He is not going to give the church up easily. He will try until when? Until the rapture. Remember, last time I told you that this whole section implies the rapture, whether you believe it or not. Okay? He is not going to give up on you. So, my dear brothers and sisters, if you are an individual, a family, or a church that have expelled Jesus you, you still got time because the church is still on this earth the rapture is coming whether you like it or not whether you believe it or not okay and Jesus is 
even looking for a small hole to reach you. Perhaps this teaching, if you are watching me now, perhaps this could be his reach out. Okay? One more chance. Okay? At last, chapter 4 and the last line, and my bowels were moved for him. <laughs> there will come a day when the bowels of us would move. Okay? So shall we go to the next segment? Okay? <laughs> Verse 5. I rose up to open to my beloved. And my hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. Why? Because Jesus was trying to open. He was handling the lock. And, and what, what does myrrh mean? Remember we talked about myrrh and we talked about uh, the, the, the fragrance. I mean... Mer talks about the royalty of Jesus. He's the king of kings. Okay. And, and, and the fragrances. They talk about the sacrifice of Jesus. The, the presence that Jesus receives from the hands of uh, believers. Remember all those we talked. So Jesus who was actually meddling with the locks. Have, he has left the, the smell, the odor, the fragrance on the lock. So when at last the Christians want to open the door, when they touch, they feel the myrrh. They feel the fragrance. They feel, aha, Jesus. Jesus was right there. But look at, look at verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved has withdrawn himself and was gone. Aha. That is rapture. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not. There comes a time when Jesus gets out of this world. He is going. Well, in fact, it's the Holy Spirit who, who takes the church. And Jesus comes from heaven halfway to welcome uh, his bride. That's all fine, but isn't he here now? He's omnipresent. Jesus is there. Is Jesus with you? Of course he is. The Holy Spirit is in you, of course. But there comes a time when Jesus is no longer to be found on earth. So repent before it is too late. When I first got saved in 1979, Sri Lanka did not have televisions. We didn't know. We didn't know that televisions existed Okay, until 1980 or 81, I think. Then in 1979, uh, we, 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 we went to watch movies in theatres. You know, these good old black and white movies. We are talking about Sri Lanka, okay? And in 1979, suddenly they brought a movie projector and they showed us a wonderful movie in the church. They darkened all the windows and they, they showed this movie that's called Thief in the Night. It was a color movie. Hey, have you watched that? It's still on YouTube. A nice old movie about the rapture and the post-rapture scenario, the coming of the Antichrist, the 666 and all the paraphernalia. Well, you would love it. It's, it's actually funny. You know, the 1970s mentality of the rapture and what would happen in the world. So uh, I, think, I think the movie was filmed in New Mexico around Gallup. Hey, those of you who are in Gallup, this movie was filmed um, where the church rock is, you know, when you come down from I-40 towards Albuquerque and, you know, when you turn left, uh, that area. So uh, it's a wonderful movie. And it showed how uh, there are friends and families who lost their colleagues and family members when they were raptured and even believers who lost fellow believers uh, who, uh, who were taken up in the rapture and those who were left behind, ooh, the, the struggle they experienced uh, of, of a white van titled Unite would come to arrest them and all that kind of stuff. Oh, it gave us a chill. We were so afraid. Ugh, you know? And uh, uh, there's a beautiful song, you know. Uh, I don't remember the whole song, but it says, um, uh, the sun is come and you'll, you'll be 
there's no time, there's no time to change your mind. The sun is come and you'll be left behind. You'll be left behind. <gasps> you know, it was so uh, frightening to watch that movie. And many skeptics said, oh, this is crazy, you know, this will never happen. But I'll tell you something, the rapture will happen. When Noah was constructing that ark for 120 years, I believe everybody ridiculed him, mocked him, saying, hey, look at that guy, building a ship on dry land, saying that there's going to be water coming from the sky. But 120 years after he started constructing the, the ark, the rain did come. Only eight of them were saved. So those who are going to be raptured would be in the very small minority, I believe in that. But the rapture is coming. It doesn't matter how many people don't believe in the rapture. It doesn't matter how many Christians preach profoundly, hermeneutically, homolytically against rapture. The rapture is coming. Hey, what if it happens? What if it happens? It doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. What if it happens? Hmm. Then... Those who are left behind would look for Jesus. They would open for Jesus. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. Yeah, the church is saying, the, the left behind church, the left behind Christians are saying, Oh, our soul failed when he spoke. When he spoke, we were closed. Yes, now we are living in the time when Jesus is still speaking to us through the word, through sermons, through, through visions, dreams, prophecies, what not. He is still speaking. But there is coming a day when he is going to stop speaking to us. And when, if we are not ready to listen to him when he is talking, he is not going to be around to listen when we talk to him. So my dear friends, repent before it's too late. My soul failed when he spake. Yeah, many Christians don't listen. They hear, but they don't listen. Many churches, they don't listen, although they hear. Huh. Many people read the word, but they don't listen to the Lord. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him. But he gave me no answer. I sought him, but I could not find him. So seek the Lord when he is able to be found before it's too late. There is coming a time when you will seek him and you will not find him. Why? Because he has withdrawn himself from the world. Jesus is no longer there. The Father is no longer there. The Holy Spirit is no longer there. Hey, I'm a Trinitarian, okay. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Yeah. Now, when we pray to him, he listens. He answers. When we call unto him, he answers. But there is coming a day when he will not answer us because he is not around. So I would say, based on verse 6, open to him when he is there. Look for him when, before he is withdrawn himself. Okay? Listen to him. Open your soul to his word when he is still speaking. Seek him when you still can find him. Call him when he is still providing answers. If not, this is what you will say after the rapture. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. A dangerous, pathetic situation. Okay, friends, now that we have started talking about the church that is left behind, come back to the next segment and let's see what is going to happen to the church during the time of tribulation from verse 7 to 16. Bye. Have a good one.